who's ready for exhale ventures welcome to the noobs bureau podcast my name is shrek it's interviews with spearfishing experts authorities and characters from around the planet today it's uh, a third Mackay installment it's uh, someone who definitely represents the area in a really cool way uh it's kurt raymond who who's kurt raymond he he's a Mackay based father frother and coal miner who has fully rebuilt a Haynes 565 and made a series of videos about it on his YouTube channel. He's not precious about viz. He gives back to his spearing community and he makes super cool, no ego, informative and wicked spearfishing vids. Go and have a look at Exhale Adventures on YouTube. I'll tell you what, if you want to learn how to redo a fiberglass boat, um, Kurt's sort of four-part series is pretty comprehensive and just sort of breaks it down into some really bite-sized chunks in terms of the knowledge you need and the planning around materials and the area and all that sort of stuff. Uh, we chat about it a fair amount in this episode, so I hope you are into that. And um, it's funny, eh, Sparrows with boats. I'm still hoping to do a full episode at some stage in the very near future about boats and Sparrows because every country sort of seems to have its own preference, so I want to sort of capture that. Like, obviously, depending on the sea state, where you're launching, all of these things sort of play a part in it, how far you're heading out. Um, you know, obviously we all are on a budget, so, uh, well, not all of us, but many of us are. So sometimes that's a constraint as well. So I'm going to do a full episode about that. If you'd like to be a part of that, or you know, someone that would be really helpful for creating an episode about a guide to boats for spearfishing, hit me up. Um, Kurt's definitely going to feature in on that one. So again, check it out, XL Adventures, but email me shrek at noobspirit.com if you want to be a part of that one. Um, and other news, I had a cracker of you. Paul, it's nice, short and sweet too, but for he, he recently did a spearfishing course over on Stratty with his partner Nish and Paul gave us five stars. He said, great location, great food, unreal instructors, highly recommend. Short and sweet, but uh, I tell you what, they were frothers of the highest degree too, so awesome to have them with us. Quick shout out for a store stocking 99 Spiro recipes and 99 tips to get better at spearfishing. Check them out in Blenheim. It's marine and outdoors. Go and see Brett and his team. And um, they stock not just spearing gear, but a whole lot of outdoor stuff as well. But check that out in Blenheim Marine and Outdoors. Guys, 99 Spear Recipes continues to fly out the door. If you want a copy, go visit your local spearfishing retailer if you want to save on postage or come to noobspear.com, particularly if you're in Australia, and I'll sort you out a copy. It'll be abs my absolute pleasure. Hey, also, Nuba Stories. I'd love to hear, maybe it's a new piece of equipment that you're using, something that's changed the game for you, something that's winning. Go to noobspero.com, head up into the menu, give back, and hit the Nooba Stories section. Leave me a voice message. Let's get into today's episode. Excel Adventures, Kurt Raymond. Here we go. Shop for your spearfishing gear at adreno.com.au. In store and online, you can use the code noobspero to save 20 bucks on any purchase over $200. Why would you shop with Adreno, I hear you say? Well, let me lay it out. Flat rate shipping, $9.99 on all orders. Hassle free returns policy. Australia, price match guarantee. Shop now, pay later with Afterpay. Fully sick brands. Huge, obnoxiously ginormous range of great spearfishing gear made just for legends like you. Go Adreno, go pro, don't be slow. Shop massive spearing gear at Adreno. I'll stop. It's a no, no. But seriously, shop with the Noob Spiro's longest running partner, Adreno. Head to adreno.com.au online or in store at their huge mega stores. Use the code NoobSpiro to save 20 bucks on any purchase over $200. Are you US based looking for freediving spearfishing gear? Neptonics is the best. Their online website so easy to use. If you've got any questions, Jerry and the team answer questions via phone, email. Anyway, they've got an easy contact form on the site. Uh, these guys are absolute legends and. Uh, if they sell it, they believe in it, they back it, they use it themselves. It's tough gear that works. Visit neptonics.com. Use the code NOOB10 to save 10% on any order at neptonics.com. That's right. Use the code NOOB10, N-O-O-B-10, on your next order. Save 10% at neptonics.com. I used to get told there are only two certainties in life, death and taxes. But I found out that there are actually three. Score a free hat of your choice when you use the code NoobSpiro with every purchase of over $100 at noobspiro.com forward slash taxman. Get some gear that's nearly guaranteed to drive away the wokesters, but gain admiration from the fishing fraternity. Go to noobspiro.com forward slash taxman and use the code at noobspiro 
when you spend $100 or more to get yourself a free hat. Again, noobsparrow.com forward slash tax man. <laughs> All right, g'day legends. I am in the heart of Mackay uh, with Kurt Raymond, the Exhale Adventures mad YouTuber. If you haven't um, checked out his YouTube channel, uh, he's got better and better over the years. Um, people might know him for refitting uh, 565 Haynes, which is a really popular fiberglass boat here in Australia. Um, all the Haynes boats have got that wicked hull shape. So if you want to see that, he sort of goes into detail about how to do that. But Kurt's channel really focuses on Mackay and surrounds. Um, having said that, he's been getting out, and I'm, I'm looking forward to picking his brain about blue water hunting because he's recently been getting into that a wee bit. And um, Kurt, mate, magic to have you on the show. We've been chatting for years. Yeah, it's been um, unreal. Like new Noob Spiro was such a big thing for me when I first started and definitely just – Progression was massive after listening, after listening to the Noob Spiro podcast. Um, there's so much info, especially in those early episodes. You guys were just banging them out and I had to play catch up a little bit. I was a little bit behind, but I'd sat down and found every episode, listened to every one and took little bits and pieces from all of it and I still use it today, you know. So, unreal. Mate, mate, it's, um, it's cool to be in Mackay and hanging out with you because you're such a Mackay frother. Like a lot of guys are kind of like, they almost come across as a bit down about the area and they focus on the shortcomings. But you, you know, like Mackay's got some um, some cons, arguably, as well. Like sometimes people say, oh, the reef's too far out. But you froth on the inshore stuff, the river stuff, the out wide stuff. You kind of just have a real big appreciation for what you have in your own backyard, which I, I like. Yeah, 100%. And it's something like that was a big focus for me with the Exhale Adventures stuff was – like especially on social media, like you see people posting like what's it like in Mackay, what can you do in Mackay and it just gets smashed, like there's nothing to do here. It's, yeah. I'm like, man, I don't have enough time to do everything. There's so much to do. Like, yeah, if you even if you don't have a boat, shore diving, um, if you're not, not into fishing, there's we've got rainforests here. We've got, like you name it, we've got it. And it's, um, there's just, everywhere is what you make it, I suppose. And um, Do you think like the attitudes with, the local conditions, it comes down to personal temperament or just people just sometimes a bit, I don't know, it's like why do people focus on the negatives with, with what yeah. they got in front of them? I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is either. I think some people need something in their life, I think, and, yeah, if, if it's negative or positive, that's just what they focus on and it's sometimes you can get caught in that as well, I suppose, like especially this time of year when the weather's, you know, like what it is at the moment. Yeah, when I come up here. Yeah. Yeah. It's dead set been like this for the last... Oh, it seems like forever, but it happens every year. So you expect it and you know it's going to come good. Um, and it always does, middle of the year, it's going to be a cracker. January through March, you sort of a bit more rainy. Yeah. And and what the, the trade winds just ripping up a bit normally. Yeah, and hit and miss and you get, yeah, you get those northerlies roll in, which can be a good thing. You get some bait, you get your mackerel. Um, Why? Why do you get the mackerel? Does it... You were starting to allude to some things you learned about current and blue water before. Oh no, that's that's different different to hear. But um, oh, it's the same as like the fishermen like match the hatch kind of stuff. Like you find the bait, you find the fish, find the pressure points. Um, you can really, providing you've got especially spearing enough viz, you know, like three to four meters viz minimum. Um, you're hard pressed to sort of not get a decent feed um, mm. straight out off the coast here. So, yeah, man, I love three, four meters viz. Yeah, some some people don't though. They they no. do seem to want ten meters. And like, do you think that's maybe one of the reasons why some people dismiss some of the local diving? I think so. And with that poorer viz, like when I first initially started, I was you know frothing on it. I still do now, but definitely a little bit more back then. And I definitely had more time back then. But um, yeah, I'd be going out in everything. Um, I think that's a big thing is just time on the water as well. Um, yeah, just really getting out there. Well, if you, if, you, if you only want glam conditions, like the reality is, is like you're going to dive less. Oh, yeah. You'll so, never get out. Yeah. And so you, you kind of just got to embrace the suck sometimes and go, yeah, yeah it's three metres, but it's fish as hell. And as well as that, there's so much technology now and like logging your dives and stuff like that. So like rip charts, for example, knowing how to read rip charts or just satellite images in general. And like right now there's viz out there. Like it's been raining, um, the river's pumping out fresh water, but there'll be viz somewhere. Yeah, right. You just gotta find it. Is, is 
so you're looking at chlorophyll, the chlorophyll charts and rip charts? Or? Uh, look at the, I think it's true color. Okay. Um, it's just the satellite image. And um, yeah, just, I've I, I got a fair idea of the areas that clean up initially um, after we've had weather like what we've had. You get the big tides and it brings that clean water in. Um, yeah, right. You'd be surprised how quickly the river will clean up here. Yeah, right. And then that's a pretty good indication of what you're going to have out the front as well. And, and the, like we're, we're, we're looking at how many days of rain have you had here? And how much, how, much, oh, how many mil? Feels like a hundred days. Yeah. I, don't know. <laughs> I couldn't tell you a mil. Um, yeah, it's been raining like stormy sort of showers on and off for the last few months. Yeah, right. So how many dry days are you thinking before it starts to clear up? And even when you're in the thick of this, is there a dirt line out there? Like Yeah, yeah, there's a definite line. If you head out like to any of the um, northern beaches, you can see it. You can see that dirty line. Okay. We were diving it last week, Ben and myself, or well, two weeks ago. Just past the dirt line? Yeah, yeah, just went out past that. Um, we had some marks that Ben's found. Um, yeah, went and checked them out. So Ben's one of your, your homies, you're always out there. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I think the connection with Ben probably would have been slightly through Noob's Bureau as well initially. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. he's a rad dude. Yeah. Like, um, contributed a lot to 99 Spirit Recipes and yeah. uh, big part of that. He's great on the camera, isn't he? Yeah, he's unreal, unreal. And just froths on everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. Everything. Proper frother. Yeah. He, does he do, did he do marine biology as well? Or yeah. Yeah, yeah like right. he's just one of those guys that are kind of just fascinated with what's happening. Yeah. Yeah, and he's a clever sort of guy too. He'd be a good dog by there. Yeah, he's really good. Fisheries officer now. Um, oh, he's a fish pig. Yeah, some yeah. ways yeah. up, up to scratch and everything. Yeah, so I think he's good. told me about a few things that I was pretty ignorant on, which is fairly common. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's, there's oh, even with that, there's so many gray areas that that sort of annoys me a bit actually. But Have you had conversations with him about the mackerel? Yeah, a little bit. What does um, he think and what do you think? Oh, we think the numbers are increasing. Because definitely, or definitely here anyway, locally. Um, yeah, I've seen more mackerel in the last few years than I've than I've ever seen. Yeah. But um, I don't know if I'm just diving better, better, or going yeah, yeah, in better yeah. conditions or what. So I, that, it's that, purely anecdotal, but yeah. yeah. That's a good level of self awareness with it too. Like sometimes we, you know, we're, we're one set of eyes in one location. We don't necessarily have enough data to say, oh, there's more or less, but. We can just say purely from our, our perspective what's mm. going on, and I, I think. But you, you can put together a lot of stuff from anecdotal reports from Spiros, you know, because we don't have all the apparatus on. Um, we're encountering Spanish in a different way than the commercial guys are. So, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, 100%. I'm not sure, like, if they breed. I'm pretty sure they big breeding area up around Lucinda, um, which is very evident when I went blue water diving up that way. Yeah. They were just everywhere. But... um in close season as well. Let's talk about that list in the video. So yep. um, you were saying it's like 800 kilometres north. Um, there's a real good video on your YouTube channel of it and you guys did some proper blue water stuff, eh? Yeah, yeah. So it was, um, yeah, it was a trip that we planned. Sort of each, each year we try and head north. The initial plan was to go to Lizard Island, which we've been to a few times before. Okay. And there's some amazing reef, you know, reef out off behind Lizard Island there camp on the island but that was off the cards this year we had tropical low which i think turned into a cyclone i'm pretty sure eventually um i don't think that one affected the australian coast but um yeah we decided to come back this side or the southern side of that bad weather and lucinda was sort of the cutoff so we're like well let's go to lucinda and um yeah had some, a couple of good days i've got very limited blue water hunting experience i've Dove the um, what was it? The Blue Water Invitational. Coffs, Blue Water, yeah. Nah, not the Coffs. Oh. Ah, Townsville Blue Water. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Blue Water Invitational, they call it, but anybody can dive. AUF. Um, yeah, I dove that. I actually took the win when I dove oh, that. Oh wow. Yeah, that was a few years back now. Um, what you? What was your bag for the day? Can you remember? I speared a sailfish, which was from memory thirty four kilos, I think, or thirty five, something like that. First one. Yeah, yeah. That would have been cool in a cop. Oh, it was unreal. Yeah. Um, I shot that very early on, like in the first hour, I think, of being out there. Yeah. And um, basically from there, the focus of the rest of the crew was to try and make sure that I got my fish. 
because they, they knew I was in with a really good chance. Um, I think I weighed in a, a Spanish and I think a Trevally, yeah, yeah. from memory. But yeah, 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 nothing too exciting, but the sailfish um, took everything out. It was really good. Sick. So, yeah, limited, limited blue water stuff. Yeah, well, well, I watched from that video, like, one thing, like, you know, you're a thoughtful guy, and, and I think with that, you, you, that comes with a level of humility. Like, you filmed your blue water vid, and you were like, hey, guys, I'm really fresh to this. Mm. I'd love your ideas and tips. Chuck them in the comments, and it sounds like you've got a fair bit of engagement. Yeah. <laughs> well, what, did you, what did you come away with in terms of learning from what people told you, and then also, like, just your experience? Um, it really cemented what I already had in my head. So I was, I've always known that I need to, not necessarily a bigger gun, but different setup. Um, always had like the breakaway on the big 1400, 1400 Rob Allen. Um, I know I need to go to a slip tip or something similar. Um, I had the floats, I got a, like a decent float line, all that sort of stuff. What I did notice is everyone's different. Um, so people that swear black and blue, you need a bungee. Yeah, yeah you need a, like a 10 meter bungee. And if I had a 10 meter bungee when I shot that, the bigger dog tooth, it would have been straight in that reef for sure. Yeah. Like it's just, so you sort of take what you think's gonna work. And I sort of took everything that I already had in my head and sort of, it just confirmed everything. So I ended up picking up a rife. Um, a Rife Marauder. Oh, I heard you said in the Adreno um, sale there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They come right down. And Black play. Friday sale with yeah. the Noob Spiro discount code. Oh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> Double dip. Um, yeah, so picked up the Rife Marauder, 63 inch, which is more like a 140. And yeah, I'm really big on keeping it simple. Um, you, you won't see roller guns in my videos. We see Ben's roller gun and even Ben admits he's like, I really wish I didn't go to roller guns. I wish I just kept it simple. And but he's yeah, they have their applications, and I'll probably definitely end up with one eventually. But um, I love mine. Eh? Yeah, I've made the switch now. Yeah, I'm a convert. Yeah, but yeah, I hear what you're saying. I like simple too, man. I'm not even a gear guy either. So I just want stuff that's I can fix if I have to, and it's just like consistent. Yeah, yeah. Because like when your accuracy goes out, and you, it's hard to diagnose because something's happened. Uh, you know, do you need complications? Like, it's already enough to figure out. You just no. want to shoot fish. Yeah, that's 100% right. Ben's like my gear guy. So if I need any advice on gear, I'm like, hey, Ben, what do you reckon? He's like, you need this much band stretch and this and that. And I'm just like, yeah, it feels good. <laughs> <laughs> I've got so, measurements written on my wall of how long my bands need to be for different yeah, guns. Yeah, yeah. Like that that. There's a few charts out there that are, like, generic from different... Um, band companies mm. but then there's a lot of discrepancy between them too yeah, that's right and um like i had a big conversation back in the day with manny bolver about you know the different two main sort of archetypes of rubber and he's talked about reactive like the snappy punchy like rob allen style rubber and then the more progressive stuff that sort of has a it has the same level of torque but it's kind of a smoother acceleration curve so it's like more suitable for rollers and stuff and then yeah, yeah that was it was interesting and i think yeah, guys get out on it. It's it's hard though, like to know where to cut your bands and you know, everyone's like, oh, 350%. You're like, fucking hell, I can't let that yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I get I get what you're saying. Yeah. So walk us through that marauder setup though. What 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 are you chucking out of it? Like is it a you run an eight mil shaft or yeah, eight mil hunt shaft with a um, hunt slip tip, which is on cable, um, stainless cable. How much what's the distance from like the cable? Um, slip to like to the end of the gun mm -hmm. like overhang yeah. wise I think it's like pretty standard like that 250 300 total um, which is what I wanted I wanted it to be similar to the to the Rob Allens and yeah it's like the, the Marauders aren't a roller gun or anything so it'd just be three 16 mil bands it's actually a setup that I think they sell in the states I didn't I couldn't find it locally but the yeah Marauder 63S is like the slip tip Eight mil shaft, sixteen mil bands. Ah, okay. Um, but yeah, I'm just basically replicating that. Yeah, nice. Well, you know, like manufacturer tested and proven. Yeah. Sometimes everyone wants to mod the manufacturer's recommended specs, and then I've tested all those variations. Yeah, that's so right. sometimes you just yeah. better off doing what they say. Yeah. And it's simple, like pull three bands back, um, yep. pull the trigger. That's oh. what I'm after. 
And so from there, like, you know, a lot of people want to get away from, um, you know, want to get into de-shackles and get away from, um, you know, everything else. What, what, what are you running from the gun back? I've got shackles yeah. um, for that same reason. I've read, you know, bigger fish. I don't know if the fish here would get that big, like straight off the coast of Australia here. They probably would. But, yeah, to bend shark clips and stuff like that. So yeah. I've just gone with um, stainless shackles. Those shark clips, I think they're rated to 200, the big heavy-duty yeah, ones. Yeah, they've like, probably never but, yeah, yeah, just but, be sure. Yeah, people talk about removing points of failure. Yeah. So, okay, so you got a, a de-shackle on the back. Was that how you're attaching your... Um... Breakaway. Yeah. Yeah, so D, just a small de-shackle on the breakaway yeah. directly to the flight line to... Um, couple of three atmosphere floats. I've got a short line between the between the floats. How short? Uh, I think it's like five meters, something like is that. Is that bungee or is that hard? No, line? that's just hard line, yeah. Because even, I, I don't know, like I heard what you were saying about hard line and like, you know, like you want rigid line so they can't bury you in the reef, you know, because you guys are sometimes over 20, 25 meters when you're shooting doggies. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's deeper, but it's not like true, like, Often it's not true, like 70, 80 metres of water or whatever. Right? No, no, that's right. And so if they get to the bottom, like you're screwed. So you don't want a bungee, eh? Not necessarily. Not not where we were. Um, we were basically starting in that sort of 100 metre mark and then drifting up onto the, like, into the zones. Yeah, um, right. Like, you can see the bottom once yeah. you get up there, but we had pretty good viz. So it would have been about 40-odd metres. Yeah. But, um, yeah, that was, that was the plan. And what, yeah, what... I was alluding to when we were chatting before was um, we were, because I had no idea and I'm only learning, but with the East Australian current, we were there at a particular time in the day. We're like, right, we need to be back there at that time because that's when the tide turned. Yeah. And like, there's no tide turn there. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, just yeah, the current yeah, hitting yeah. it. So we're waiting for this special time. We could have been diving the whole time. But anyway, um, you learn that and that's sort of why it was a special spot. You know? Yeah, because it's the EAC directly onto pressure yeah, points. When we pulled up, there was just bait. Like the surface was just alive with different schools of bait oh, and sick. just fish just smashing bait. And there was birds and there was sharks. You know, when we pulled up, I don't know, half a dozen sharks came straight up to the back of the boat. And um, one of the boys is like, should we get in here? And I'm like, we should definitely get in here. This is where we need to be. And, yeah, it really was. Sick, man. That's sick. What, um, what was the rigid line you're running? Um, it is, it's just rope basically. It's like f rated 430 kilos, something like that. I splice it all myself, um, make different lengths. I've used it for all my float lines. It floats really well. Yeah. Okay. And it's, yeah, it's super strong. Okay, sick. And sometimes guys talk about those ropes cinching up on them when they shoot true blue water fish and um, very hard to fight fish without a clutch and you know, just burning or wrecking your hands and, you know, you sometimes you just want something pretty stable to grab hold of. How did you find it? Had to, have you shot anything big enough to really test that system yeah, well, out? And shot that sailfish with it. Yeah, yeah I've right. shot, yeah. Um, yeah, it was fine. Okay. But I, I will, um, having said that, I have trialled, like, different clutch systems with it, um, just using a shark clip. Yeah. It does slide through that a little bit, yeah, but right. it does offer some resistance. That's um, yeah, and I've, I've made small clutches as well, yeah. um, which is something that Ben and I are going to look at making up something else with a different material and see if we can get a better result. And um, on top of that, I'm also looking at just picking up Old Man Blue's float line. Yeah, built -in I was going to tell you about it. Yeah. That's right on where I was going because I was like, his, his one's getting pretty good reviews. Man. Yeah. Like guys are shooting big fish with it and like, yeah, I, I feel like it's. Um, I don't want to plug him too much because he's my mate, but like, like he he makes real good shit. Like, yeah, and he, like he's got two mates, and those guys shoot some of the most. They're shooting blue water fish a lot, and yeah. um, they give they run it through the paces and they rave about it. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's reasonably simple. That's what I like mm, about it. It's yeah. just a, it's just rope. Like, yeah, it's good. Some of the better ropes like um, Rife have got that wicked line. But I think that, that it's not that great in a true blue water situation because of those reasons, like it's hard to clutch yeah. and some things like that. But, yeah, I don't want to throw them under the bus. A great band, great brand. They oh, make yeah, some awesome stuff. Yeah. Yeah. 
a bit like Rob Allen too. Yeah. Like, you know, these these guys have been doing this stuff for years. You've got yeah. nothing but high regard for them. That's right. And they, they put their research in as well. I love those little clips that Rob puts out. I froth on them a little bit where he's breaking everything and yeah. puts everything through the test. He's very dry, isn't he? Yeah. It's, it's, it's not like some highly viral channel. It's no. uh, He's not going to do well on TikTok. No, no, but, no. like, in terms of information for Spiros, like, that's where it's at, eh? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's good to see it all in action. Same as Chris Coates, like, yeah. just yeah. just proper gear testing yeah. vids and stuff. Um, and garage testing, too. Yeah. Like, it's not like, they're not like, um, you know, it's not like hardcore engineering workshop stuff. It's just Spiros, like, yeah. working stuff out. It's yeah. cool. Are you in the market for a new spear gun? Killshot Spear Guns has got blue water wahoo tuner guns, open track spear guns, enclosed track spear guns, rear handle enclosed tracks. Check them out at killshotspearguns.com. Even better, I've got some good news for you. You can save $30 on any Killshot Spear Gun at killshotspearguns.com. Use the code NOOB. If you're in store, just say crikey mate, or say Shrek from the Noob Spiro sent you and you'll save $30. Ed Martin at killshotspearguns.com. Check them out. At the Noob Spiro, we love the job fish and have a range of rad gear that celebrates this awesome fish. Called the Uku by our Hawaiian family, the green job fish is a unique benthopelagic fish of the Lejanidae family. Beautiful to eat, notoriously challenging to hunt, and amazing to watch in the water. The green jobby deserves our admiration. Celebrate the Spiro life with some Jobfish tribute gear, only available at noobspiro.com. Ocean Guardian is the world's leading shark deterrent technology company. Since 2001, their independently proven and tested products have been allowing ocean goers all over the world to enjoy the ocean without a worry. Their technology is so effective, the Western Australian government offers a $200 consumer rebate for the purchase of the Freedom Plus Surf and Freedom 7. Uh, guys, get into it. We've got a discount code for you, 10% off your Shark Shield device if you want to get the Freedom 7 or the Scuba 7. Get 10% off. Use the code NoobSpiro at checkout. If you are at Ocean Guardian uh, US site or ANZ site, uh, get into it. Get in amongst it. Ocean Guardian are doing awesome things for Spiros. For you, like, these days, like, I know you've taken a few firsts and stuff, and that's the journey of Spearing, isn't it? Like, talk to me about a recent fish that you've learned to target somewhat successfully and how you're doing it. Um, I think definitely, well, Spanish are a big one. Spanish is something that I just love. Actually, I don't know who you were talking to recently, but one of your podcasts, they're the kind of fish that sort of like gets your heart racing a little bit and yeah. you're, you'll be out there actively hunting for them and you won't see them for four, five, six dives and then all of a sudden they're just there and it's, yeah. I, sp I find myself sort of like having to calm myself down, um, which is something that I've really been trying to focus on more recently. But um, yeah, Spanish man, so much fun, so much fun. I had a day out there um, back in 2022, I think now, um, solo, which I don't recommend. <laughs> um, you'll, notice, you'll notice in my videos now, I'm, I'm, rarely, I'm rarely solo, I'm always with somebody. Um, yeah, I don't want to sort of send the wrong message to the younger divers. It definitely, it's, it's super fun getting out there by yourself and doing that sort of stuff. And I, a hundred percent, I will do it again. Um, but yeah, highly don't recommend it. Um, not if you can avoid it, but there is that, there's that element. I don't uh, know. I don't know. It's like that. Yeah. It's fun being out there by yourself and it's yeah. you sort of sit back and appreciate it all. And yeah. But Spanish, sorry. Um, yeah, now we'll come back to that though. Yeah, I yeah. want to have that conversation with you a bit more. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, Spanish. Um, I was in town for a meeting. I, I made a little video on this, I think, actually. I was in town for a meeting um, from work, which is unusual for me. I'm an underground coal miner. I'm back in town a little bit early, so I had a little bit of time in the afternoon. Put the tinny on, down to the ramp, out within an hour. I was, you know, schooled up by Spanish. And I'd recently lost a really good Spanish diving solo. Um, so I thought today I'm not gonna make the same mistake. I had a second gun ready to go. So oh, I, yeah. I shot this Spanish with the intentions of getting back to the boat, um, either taking the boat over to the float or 
getting another gun out of the boat, which is it just worked out perfect. Shot this fish, it circled around to the boat. It basically pulled me around to the boat, reached in, grabbed a second gun. It had fatigued a bit by then and um, yeah, put a second shot in it. And then pre-current bag limits, um, I think we can take two now anyway, but yeah, a second Spanish, like they were just hanging around with that fish in the water for a bit and um, process that fish, put it up in the boat, clip my second gun off on the float line this time on my, underneath my float and swam around, found another good fish and um, yeah, did the same thing again, repeated the process. <laughs> um, they're like 15, 17 kilo fish. Oh, nice. Just Spanish for days and yeah. probably more than I needed really, but um, yeah. It, it went out to everybody, everybody got a little bit. Yeah. It's good. Do you, you smoke fish, do I? Yeah, yeah try to. Yeah. How good is Spanish smoke? Oh, it's so good. Yeah. And raw. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's so good. First told, I reckon Spanish is pretty versatile. Yeah. But, like, I love it on a smoker. I think it's probably, it'll be the best fish you could have on a smoker. I haven't eaten a better fish off a smoker. Yeah. Mm. I've tried a few different ones, but, yeah, I think Spanish is definitely up there. Grey mackerel is really good as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah all the scombrids, though. Eh? Mm. Mm. Yes, I love a good Spanish. And they <laughs> fight good too, man. They, yeah. like you say, like they get your heart rate going. They're always fun. Yeah, always. They're always fun. It's just, um, yeah, yeah, good fun. Especially in that, like what you were saying before, that little bit murky water too. And they sort of, you can just see them on the edge of viz. And, yeah, you, you seem know, to get that a lot. Like yeah. you're, you're often bottom hunting and they come in sort of three, four meters off the bottom. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, different spots. They behave a bit differently. But yeah, that. A couple of spots here, that's just what they do. They'll be cruising around the bottom rather than up, up Yeah, higher. I was talking about this last night with uh, with um, Dusty. Like, yeah. and we're, I, I was trying to, I've, I've been trying to work out the rhyme or reason to why they're at certain spots in the water column. Because you can be in 20 metres of water with 10 metres viz, and they're Spanish there, but you're not seeing them because they're like literally a metre and a half off the bottom. Yeah. And like sometimes, oh yeah, that's where the bait are, right? So yeah, well, there's a thermocline. Sometimes that can be a reason, but... A lot of the time they're mid water, um, and then but then sometimes they're like right up in the water column, and it's like I can't figure it out. I can't no, figure them out. I don't, I don't know. know yeah, but it's um yeah. Well, that that day with the with the two that schooled me, they were up on the surface. Yeah. Um, all my big ones that I've speared, the twenty plus kilo ones, have all been off the bottom. Yeah. Advice for guys that are shooting them, because like you've kind of loosely alluded to, like. They seem to be a fish that you always want to put a second shot into. Yeah. Now, I, I, I don't think I've, oh, I've stoned maybe like two out of what I have a mini dozen I've shot, you know? Yeah. For you, like, um, I'm like, a shocker. Yeah. I'm a shocker with Spanish. I'm, I'm a gut shot king with Spanish. Oh, yeah. I always go for that backbone shot and it's, it's like ingrained in my head. It might be Noob Spiro's fault actually, but it's always, you know, that, that mid body's, mid body shot's the best shot and it's yeah. like, can't get it out of my head. But there's Between something... the anal and the dorsal, there yeah. is a real big bit of wicked bone structure there, but it's so easy to hit them low. Oh, yeah, and hit yeah. them forwards a little bit. Um, yeah, I really need to start going for the headshot. Like, yeah. I'm a good shot. I should just go for the headshot. But, um, yeah. yeah. That quartering away, like, it's a perfect shot if you can get it up and come out just sort of their head or, you know, inside, you know, in on the gill side and then out the other side of their yeah. head. But like, I don't know, there's a lot of bone there too, man. If it's a longer shot, like, you're not necessarily going to penetrate either, so. No, no, that's right. Yeah. Out the gill plates again. Like what you said, that angled, that angled shot, out the gill plate. Doesn't, it doesn't always work that way. No, no. Like, you can't just go, all right, fish, I just want you yeah, to just, do, turn, uh, just turn right there and <laughs> sit, just hang on. This it's way me shooting here. <laughs> You've got to, like, really make it easy for me. Yeah. I've only got my little gun, stay close. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, for a while there, like I was using a, um, well, I still use it, it's my favourite gun, it's a um, spear gun engineering Duncan Henderson roller. Yeah. And for a while there, like I, I shot like with about 15 kilo Spanish and I wasn't penetrating him and I knew I wasn't too far away, I was good, like single wrap, um, but straight onto a reel and I wasn't penetrating him and I thought it was just that rollers were a little bit underpowered but I just left the pretension on too long and that band had oh, sort of, yeah. you know, they just didn't have the same life in it. Yep. you got to change them a bit more often. Yeah. Those single rollers are still good for it, but yeah. you just got to have them wound up a wee bit. You saw it, you saw it popped off, obviously. It's just like in the boat, pretension all the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or freaking even get home from a day just diving and leave it there for a couple of hours while I fill it fish and it's still got all the pretension on it. It's just like, 
Like, it's just not looking after your gear properly. Nah, I'm a shocker for that. Yeah. I, I might hose it off and chuck it in the shit. Yeah. Well, away. with rollers, you you have to take the pre-tension off. Otherwise, yeah. you're just going to – that life that, – that rubber's got so much life. It's under tension all the time while you're out spearing, so you have to take it off. And you've got to – I reckon because of that, you've got to change it more often. Too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, like, back to what you were saying about keeping it simple, sometimes it's nice just to have – Predictability. And, yeah. Yeah. Like, how much life do you get out of a set of bands on your oh, guns? Years. Like, over a year. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, if I've got a big trip or something coming up, like the Lucinda trip, I'll put some fresh rubber on. Yeah. But, yeah, like, locally, I'll, I'll show you in a minute. I've got some barra scales there from a, a barra that I shot, like a 900 Rob Allen twin 16 mil bands, I think seven and a half mil shaft, blunt, just punches through barra like yeah um yeah i'm like what i said earlier like keep it simple i'm really really big on keep it simple and yeah that's that's just it for me i think um all my guns are the same same overhang you know same same trigger mech they're all just rob allen tuners basically just different lengths yeah nice yeah it's nice to have that you you just don't have the dramas of accuracy no you don't even have to think Mm. Um, I want to chat with you a little bit about solo diving versus buddy diving in a sec, but before that, I want to talk about um, limited vis diving. Yeah. Um, so we were talking about embracing it, even when you're out in three or four meters and still going out. But there are people that have heightened anxiety, I guess, when they're di- diving in dirty water, and sometimes it's for good reason. Mm. Like um, some some sharks, like bull sharks in particular, can be a little bit unpredictable and, and and intimidating in low vis conditions. Yeah. Um, and there's the unknown, like diving down to 10 or 12 metres when you can only see three, four metres down the water column for, for new guys and for, for some people just in particular, they don't like low vis conditions. Talk to me about how you develop confidence with that type of diving. Um, when I first started diving, I would dead set nearly have the the jaws theme playing in the back of my head sometimes i'm like get that out of your head um i think a big thing for me is that relaxing on the surface and um like spearfishing for me is like i've never done yoga but i assume it's similar to yoga and like just the breathing techniques and relaxing and i think i can get myself like super relaxed and i'll take that into the dive kind of regardless of the visibility. Yep. Um, definitely more recently, especially here, which is a whole other topic and I'm not, I don't really know too much about it to be honest, but I just know that there has been a lot more shark encounters and I've seen a lot more bigger sharks on the coast here over the last two to three years. So it's definitely something that's coming more into the back of my mind um, as recent as the last trip that we just did. Yep. Um, big bull shark, dirty water. And yeah, just first dive on a new spot swam straight up to me. And it's, yeah, it's not unusual now, I guess, but that's that's what has changed. Like I'm sure a few years back diving close to where we were the other day, you, you'd be hard pressed to see a shark. Like, um, A lot of yeah. people are commenting on the same, they're saying they're seeing increased numbers up and mm. down the coast. And bigger sharks, I think. Like. You see your common ones, like there's a few spots around here that a particular shark's just always there. But what um, are you getting a lot of? Is it it's grey whalers and dusky whalers? Is it? Yeah, greys um, and bull sharks, really. Reef um, sharks? Like, like yeah. Black yeah, tip there's, there's the occasional black tip that you get. You see the um, really small black tips coming up in the flats and yeah. stuff up here. Um, yeah, diving the closer islands and the headlands, it's it'll be a bull shark, nine times out of ten. Um, yeah. So, when you've had encounters with them, um, does it, does it give you heightened anxiety for a bit? How do you deal with it? Depends on the fish. Um, this most recent one, it was like reasonably curious. Um, it came straight into me. We decided to do. Um, I did the first drop. Um, we decided to swim up a bit, up in front of the boat and do another drop. Um, and Ben, you know, Ben had a dive and he got down. I don't know if he got all the way to the bottom, but he said he could see a big, big shadow move down underneath him and he just came back up and we yeah. just moved on. <laughs> um, so it's, 
making yeah. good calls. Yeah, basically, like, what's it worth? Like, yeah. is it worth hanging around with this unknown fish and these poor, um, poor viz, or do we just go somewhere else? We went somewhere else. Yeah, it sucks when it's one of your favourite spots. Yeah, it was a new spot and it felt good. It felt good, yeah. and that's why he was there. Like. Yeah, well, that, that's the thing too. Like, if, you, if you're in the water, like you said, with that blue water stuff, like you, when you see sharks, it's like, it's probably not there for a reason. It's because mm. it's fishy. Like, you're in a good spot. Yeah, that's right. So, and that is the nature of spearing sometimes. But it's hard, like, particularly limited viz with big, unpredictable, it's like, like say, you make the call. Hey, yeah. I don't feel like putting a tourniquet on you today, buddy. No, what's it worth? Yeah. Yeah. Just move on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, cool. All good. Um, all right. So, I mean, we've got heaps of stuff to chat about. I wanted to revisit that buddy conversation on solo yeah. diving. So, like, there is a – I've been hearing a lot lately, like, some of my mates with YouTube channels that um, do a fair amount of solo diving are coming under criticism, and maybe rightfully so, because it's inadvertently – encouraging younger divers to dive like that mm -hmm. and you know at a sort of a strategic level a lot of comps have moved from you know solo style comps to pairs based comps mainly for safety yeah and there's a changing mindset with spear and, and some of these youtubers are kind of you know maybe make, uh, getting young divers to revisit that and I, I solo dive I do um, I, don't, I do it less and less these days, but like I do enjoy it. I'm not saying I don't, but I understand when I go out, I, I don't have any safety equipment when I do that. I, I, um, my diving style has to change and I know I'm way less safe. And also like there's no one there to share in the froth or pump a second shot if I put in a typical yeah. spectacular shot. <laughs> um, there's heaps of advantages to diving with a buddy and like if you've got a good buddy, like it's better than solo diving, I reckon. Yeah. It's, it's, I don't know, it's, it's that different element as well. Like there's the, there's the buddy froth. It's hard because I, I don't want to advocate it, but it's, um, it's a nice feeling heading out there by yourself sometimes and, and doing it. But again, it's, it's definitely not the safest thing to do. And you, anybody who's um, watched my channel for any sort of period of time will notice that pretty well every time I head out now, I'm, I'm with somebody. Yeah. Um, now there is a reason behind that yeah. because I have had a scare. Um, my mum doesn't know this, so if she listens to this, she'll find out now. <laughs> but um, very controlled environment, um, free dive training, and I had a blackout on the surface. So leading up, like I have had some time to think about the dive. It wasn't. It was a thirty meter dive, which I've done plenty of times. Um, poor sleep the day before. Um, probably not the best. Um, definitely not the best lead up to the dive and I felt really good till I hit the surface. I, I did two or three recovery breaths. Um, one, of the, one of the other guys who was the safety diver for me saw me as I was coming up and I, I still remember this. He said he, said he was looking at me and he said I, I was looking at him and then I looked away from him. And I, I actually actively remember doing that. I was looking at him swimming up and I was saying, this feels real weird. So I, I turned to look away and he, he took that as something different, mm. um, which was good yeah. for me when I hit the surface. And um, for anyone who hasn't experienced, before, experienced it before, um, when I hit the surface, it was like the, the deepest, best sleep I've ever had <laughs> when I blacked out. Yeah. It, was, it was really strange. I woke up and I was like, oh, I feel so refreshed. It's like a, it was like a hard reset and oh, wow. it really put into perspective with all the solo diving, um, you know, how close have I been in the past? Yeah. And you, you wouldn't know because I felt good when I was coming up. You just don't know. Yeah, uh, Ted Hardy talks about it all the time, you know, and I, <laughs> like everyone sort of, we have a, we have an overinflated opinion of how self-aware we are with regards to where we're at with oxygen and blackout. And you can black out in the shallow, you can black out after a deep dive, but you're not gonna know when it's gonna happen. No. And that's why we preach buddy diving because they're your only safety mechanism, someone watching you, you know? And um, yeah, that's a, that was, it would've been good for you, man. Yeah, yeah, it, was, um, it definitely slowed the spearing down a lot. And I, I think that looking back, I've been doing a lot of like self-reflection on it um, 
Yeah, it was a little while back now. But my diving definitely took a big hit. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm getting it back now. As well as that, I was super busy and didn't dive as much. But, yeah, it, um, it definitely took a, took a big hit. I um, Sometimes I'll be flat out at work, and I think you're a bit the same. You know, like if you pump out 50 hours in a physical job, Monday to Friday, and then, you, you know, you, you don't even have to have any beers or anything, but you go out diving on the Saturday, your body's carrying fatigue, maybe a crap night's sleep, mm. and then you go out on a boat and maybe you're with competitive people that make you feel like you've got to perform somehow. That's a recipe for disaster too. Oh, yeah, yeah for sure. And, like, I know that sometimes if I've had a week like that and I try to go diving, I'm pretty pathetic. Yeah. Like, and, and, but you've just got to, like, it's hard to have the wisdom to just adjust your dive in a suit where you're at physically. Yeah. Yeah. And but you should also let your buddies know, like, hey, I've had a pretty big week. I'm going to take it pretty easy today. Yeah, like, definitely. And it's hard though sometimes. Everyone's like, oh, you know, like you read ads and and Facebook groups and shit. Like, hey, looking for a diver for tomorrow? Must be twenty plus meter diver. And I'm just like, that doesn't sound that fun. Nah. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I can, I can do it. I'm capable of doing it. But is that what I want to aim to do for the day? Go out there and I don't know. Sometimes. Yeah, I want to shoot some fish and have some fun, but do I need to? Do we need to go twenty plus? Yeah, do I need to push myself all day? Yeah, yeah. that's what's good about here, I suppose. It's relatively shallow diving, um, if you want it. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's cool. It's cool just being able to have fun. Yeah, and I think when you've got a good group of mates, you're able to communicate like that and tell each other and and work around that stuff. Yeah, definitely, definitely. definitely. I'm normally happy if someone's like that because they're happy to go boaty for longer. Yeah. <laughs> you guys anchor a lot here as well, don't you? Uh, yeah, depending, depending on what's going on. Um, like if it's just me and another guy. Um, obviously, every, everything's, well, for me anyway, is not, I wouldn't say calculated, but I have a good think about, you know, like, right, what's the run like? Um, are we in a high boat traffic area? All that sort of stuff. Um so, like recently, um, Ben and myself, we've been doing some diving on some wrecks and both, there's another video coming out on Sunday, which is on that same wreck, but both those days have been like not much run, a little bit of run, but not much. And it's anchor the boat, down current, swim up, dive. Um, we've also been running a, like a 30, maybe even 40 meter rope out the back of the boat as well. Yeah, just to have that extra element of safety. Um, and as well as that, we pick, you know, pick your spots. You don't want to be and doing your tides it. up here. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's right. right. Yeah. Um, we were talking about big tides. I didn't really realise how big the tides were in Mackay until I started to come up here for a trip. And then I was like, ah, yeah, we definitely have to look at neeps and yeah, all that sort of yeah, stuff. That's right. Whereas Brizzy's kind of pretty tide forgiving. Yeah. You know, and... Um, yeah, so much to learn about what we were chatting about earlier too. Like, spearing is like a, a gateway into learning more about the natural world, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. It, definitely. If you're smart, you just you have to pay attention to it because you want to get better at what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Mm. You look for those trends and yeah. 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 I was saying to you how the BOM website, uh, Bureau of Meteorology Australia, has got some really phenomenal articles in there for like understanding some some fairly common weather patterns, but understanding it at a greater depth than a lot of people do. Yeah. And uh, I've started geeking out a bit more about stuff on there because it's good to have more knowledge. I'm, like I've got a bit of responsibility yeah, and I kind of have Definitely. to know some of the stuff. And, and I don't, and I don't, I, you know, you can read and, and talk to people about stuff that, like I've been doing it for 10 years, it's still just scratch the surface. So there's a lot more that I don't know that I do, you know. Yeah, that's right. Um, for you though, talking about um, learning and mastery, like you went and did your freediving instructors fairly recently? Um, it was the end of 2022, yeah. Okay, so yep. you've had it, so you've had like a year and a half? Yeah, but I honestly have not been teaching or anything. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, like what I was saying, I purely did it for our dive club here, the Mackay Down Under Skin Divers, our spearfishing club now, Mackay Down Under Spearfishing Club. Um, yeah, just to, helped the club out, me and a couple of the other guys went up and did it. Um, yeah, we just wanted to start some pool training, start some other stuff. So when we got weather like what we've got at the moment, you can stay on top of it and keep progressing. Um, so yeah, it'd be good to pick your brain with some training plans and schedules and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, we're going to cross notes because I'm starting one in Brizzy. And so I like seeing these pool training groups start up and that are more like Spiro focused. Yeah. Because like um, 
like we're talking like having a safety night where you just show guys the ropes of like rescue. Yeah. You shouldn't need to have to go and pay for a freediving course to learn how to do a rescue. No. And I think it should be drilled fairly often. Yeah. You know, like like you say, like understanding how to manhandle someone when they're unconscious is like you think you know how to do it, but you don't until yeah. you've had a few practices at it. Yeah, definitely. Especially the good guys. Yeah, <laughs> you'd love to pull me up, off oh, of wouldn't you? I don't know if you know Lex O'Connor. But yeah, that's, yeah, yeah I Lex. dragged him up from yeah. some depth at, up at um, Lake Eaton. So did you do your instructors then? No, no, I did a level oh, one with those guys oh, yeah. a few years back yeah. with Lex. and um, He's highly he's regarded that bloke. Yeah, he's an awesome yeah. dude. I've got to get him on. Yeah. yeah. He's uh, recently on Stork Outdoors. I had a good listen to it. I've, I've chatted with Flex backwards and forwards over the years because yeah. he was friendly with the, the Back to Basics boys as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, as, as ran the course with him. Yeah. Um, but I spent most of my time with, with Lex. Yeah. That yeah. was good. I've heard nothing but good things about him. So with your instructors, um, what did you learn on that? And what, did, what, what lends well to a sparing side of things? Um, obviously, the safety. Um, streamlining especially streamlining like spiros are some of the worst streamliners ever and um especially a spiro who's never done a freediving course a shocking finning technique um they're they're the big things i was i've been thinking about this more recently because you sort of you get a bit lazy with it sometimes and you you don't realize like i'm starting to you know like i'm wasting time and I'm, i'm actually mentioned it in this video that I'm putting out on um, today, actually. It's like doing the deeper dives. I'll, I've been getting like distracted on the way down. Like I'll be swimming down and I'll catch something. It's not what I'm after, but I'll, it's caught my eye and I'll, I'll lift my head and I'll, you know, I'll break that streamline. And yeah. instead of taking, you know, 20 seconds to get down 20 meters, it's taking me 30 or 40 because I'm yeah. mucking around. Oh, and you lost hunting time, oh, mate. Man. It, it just, just kills me. Yeah. It pulls you out of free fall too. Yeah. yeah. Because, like, if you've got good duck dive and you're carrying good momentum, after sort of 10, 12 metres, you, you're not really working to get to the bottom. No. A lot of people will think that you, you have to work as hard to get to 20 as you did to 10, but if you're in free fall and you've got good um, streamline, it's actually not a lot of extra work. No, no, it is don't. work to come up to yeah. get that going again, so you do have to have that level of awareness with it. But, yeah, so if you're hunting mid-water yeah. and pulling, pulling yourself out of streamline, though, you're working to get the 20. Yeah, yeah, and, and you're working the whole position and it's, mm. it's shocking. Yeah, yeah. ideally, yeah, streamlining, um, a big thing. Um, kicking technique, being relaxed on the surface um, in sort of all conditions, that's a big, a big takeaway from a free dive course, something that um, a lot of Spiros, unless they have actively gone out and researching it and stuff like that, um, uh, diving before they're relaxed enough to dive. Yeah, yeah that's, that's right. And not having good enough brace, you know, wearing a dive watch. Um, yeah, just, just for service intervals. That's really. right. Yeah, that's all I use it for. Um, yeah, they're, yeah. The, they're the big takeaways anyway. And, and reiterating how to teach as well, because I've, I've done other courses. I'm a kite surfing instructor, uh, believe it or not. Yeah, you've got that, yeah. It's all that similar yeah. structure. Um, yeah, yeah, scaffolding and, and, and leading someone up to performing a big task rather than, like with spearing, we just throw each other in the water and throw each other to spearing yeah. and let him figure it out. It's yeah. like, and then when, you, when you're good, like you forget, you forgot what you learned. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, it's brutal. But when you don't know how to teach, you get used to breaking big tasks down into small building blocks. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and you've got that about you. You're a really good communicator. Like Exhale Adventures, like one of the good things you do is you're sharing your adventures, but you're also sharing what you're learning and what you've been reminded of. And like when I watch a video like that, I want to feel the froth for a start, which you do really well about your local area and your local diving. But then also to be reminded of things and to learn a couple of things along the way, that's cool. Yeah, Yeah, that's that's what I try and do. I I don't hit the mark in every video, but I, I do my best to, yeah, to try and bring yeah, what's going on through my head as I'm doing it. Mm. And it's a really good tool to look back. And like yeah. what I was saying, how like my diving's definitely taken a hit um, post that incident that I talked about. But yeah, like slowing head movements down and being more comfortable on the bottom and all that sort of stuff. Like I got to a stage where I was super relaxed on the bottom and I, I want to get back to that and I'm mm. starting to get back there now. But um, yeah, it's good for that. It's good to sort of self-reflect and watch all that footage back. Sometimes the freediving side of it is good because, like, 
if it's just pure hunting, you're not actually enjoying the diving side of it. No. You just too, it's everything's about the fish. And don't get me wrong, we're there to take fish. Like I love that side of it too. But like when you lay on the bottom at a new depth, there's like a real like sense of wonder and accomplishment that you're comfortable there for a start, and you can just enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. And that's a cool place to hunt from. Feeling like that, it is. rather than feeling like you're out of breath. You really just want to kill something, and then like it's like there's this urgency over you, yeah. and it's 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 not as enjoyable. No, no, hundred percent. It's good to know you got time when you when you're down there. Yeah, and you start doing like, um, yeah. The other day I had like a school of um, golden trevally, just small golden trevally swimming around me. I was just laying on the bottom and pulled the GoPro off my head, and I was filming them, and because it was just a cool experience, it felt cool for me. So I'm like, yeah, I enjoy that sort of stuff. Ocean Guardian is the world's leading shark deterrent technology and the great news is they're now partners with the Noob Stereo Podcast. You can save 10% on the Freedom 7 or Scuba 7 when you shop at Ocean Guardian. Uh, use the code Noob Spiro at checkout to save 10%. If you want to go there easy, super easy, go to noobspiro.com forward slash OG. Short for Ocean Guardian, pretty original, eh? Pump in the code NoobSpiro and you'll save 10% on your shark shield device. Get into it, get amongst it. Ocean Guardian are doing awesome things for Spiro. Hey guys, not sure how you stay hydrated out on the boats on those long days out on the water, uh, but staying hydrated is absolutely critical to cool. It's good equalization and looking after your body, making sure you're not doing those awkward one-legged kicks to the surface when, when one leg cramps out on you. Go to aqualite.com.au and get yourself a box of sachets. You just simply add them to water. It's less than $1.28 per serve. It's cheaper and, cheaper and healthier than any other sports drinks on the market. Aqualite will make a difference in your spearfishing. Check it out at aqualite.com.au. Use the code NoobSpiro to save 10% on any order. Check it out. Aqualite, made in Western Australia. I love that feeling underwater when you pull the trigger and you know exactly where that shaft is going. You want something dependable. You want to put that fish that you've been chasing for a lifetime in the boat, in the cooler, in the esky, in the chili bin if you're in New Zealand. Why do we call all these things different names? Anyway, today's show sponsor, KillshotSpearGuns.com, make awesome wooden timber spear guns, a fantastic shooting platform. If you've ever shot a big timber gun, you know the, the reliability that you get from these things. Uh, he mostly makes enclosed track spear guns. Visit him at killshotspearguns.com. Use the code NOOB to save $30 on any Killshot spear gun. I'm going to link up some of the vids we've chatted about today. If guys are curious, it's XL Adventures on YouTube. Um, Kurt Raymond, search that up. But if you go to noobspiro.com forward slash exhale, I, think, I don't think that's taken that link. Um, I'll link up today's show notes and then guys can, um, I'll, or any of the vids we've chatted about, I'll try and link them up today. Um, but there's a number of good ones, like I was talking about earlier, like with uh, with rebuilding a fiberglass boat. Um, let's chat a wee bit about that if we can. So yeah. walk me through the sort of the progression from, like, did you buy the boat? Did you buy the bones? What, what did that look like? Yeah, it was a complete hull when I bought it. I bought it off a mate from work. I traded a... WR450 <laughs> motorbike for it and a little, bit, a, a little bit of cash, yeah. And um, knowing that it needed a full rebuild, but it had, you know, reasonably good bones. Um, um, it definitely took a lot longer than what I thought it would and it was probably more work than what I thought it would. And I put that on myself a little bit as well because I wanted it a particular way. Um, yeah, it was, a, it was a complete hull gutted it down to nothing, um, ground everything back and basically started fresh. Um, yeah, it was a massive project, massive project. So, okay, so I've got a boat sitting there in the backyard. What do I need to cut out and what's involved with that, like in terms of PPE and all that? Because it's pretty nasty shit, isn't it? Yeah, it is, it is. Um, you can wear like what's called a sperm suit, um, which is... I don't think they call them just sperm suits. That's what we call them <laughs> um, I think they're like coveralls or something like that. And you can wear them. You can tape yourself up. You can tape your ankles up, tape your wrists up, wear gloves, um, enclosed shoes, all that sort of stuff, full masks and everything. But I'm telling you now, it still gets in. Um, you, really, you really do get used to it. And the best thing to do is to just 
hook in, plan it all, and get the grinding out of the way because that's that's the itchy bit. Is the grinding? It's the uh, getting rid of the old glass. That's all the little fibers, and the, it's a combination of the fiberglass and the resin that makes that itch. Yeah, right. So just the fiberglass mat, you can touch it and stuff. Away. It's not itchy. It's yeah. that, um, yeah, once it's combined and then you grind it, it's that little particles. And is it so, carcinogenic? Is it like bad for your lungs? Can you get any? I've, I believe so, but I've, I've heard, I've read recently um, mixed things about it, but, yeah, I'm no expert on it. I just made sure that I was always um, covered up with high-quality masks. And, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm an underground coal miner as well, so like dust is a big thing, like yeah. black lung. Um, so I'm pretty, pretty much that sort of stuff. Yeah. yeah, it sucks though. People don't like wearing them. Like it's no. hard to get used to, and the build up of CO two, like yeah. it's, it's uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah, altering your breathing and spiros are sometimes hyper conscious of that as well. Yeah. yeah, and if you're in a hot, dusty environment too, like wearing a mask on top of that feels worse. Yeah, yeah. Cause there's a psychological aspect to it too, isn't there? Yeah, that's right. But yeah, it's, it's safe. It's what you need to do. Did you try and, like, were you doing it in your shed? Um, so did you apply any sort of vacuum pressure to try and suck all that nastiness <laughs> out? Or? Um, what I actually did was mum and dad had got a bit of land out of town. So 90% of the heavy grinding and everything like that happened out there. So it was minimal dust. In the open air? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. nice. Minimal dust at home. Thanks, mum and dad. Yeah, thanks, mum and dad. <laughs> um, Sorry, I'm not trying to put you on the spot. No, the NBA no, will get you in trouble. No, <laughs> the other thing, um, which, which was good about doing it out there, was I, I did have like positive ventilation for myself, um, but you could hose a boat out at the end of the day. Um, obviously, you can't fiberglass on that straight away, so you yeah. wait wait a period for it to all dry out again. You're just washing all the dust off it. Yeah, and it's suppression as well. If yeah. You know what I mean? It's not just sort of flat around. Yeah, yeah right. Mate. Okay, so you, you grind it back, um, get everything just sort of schmecko. Yeah. What did you have left? Like, what didn't you grind out? So it's oh, not much. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I left the cab on. Um, I left the cab on the boat. A lot of people turn, turn them into centre consoles. Um, I wanted it to be like a family boat slash bureau boat. So the cab stayed on. I wanted to be able to sleep in there as well. And pretty well everything that was going to have glass attached to it needed to be ground back to glass, so flow coat gone. Um, yeah, there was not much left. I completely rebuilt the back end of it. Um, just the outer skin of the transom stayed on the boat. Everything on the you know on the inside of the boat got, got pulled out. Yeah. And What'd you do to the transom? Beefed it up. Um, so did you just add to, to the existing or did you cut it right out? And no, yes, yeah, so I left that out of fiberglass skin yeah. and then everything else got removed. So it had timber, like rotten timber. Um, yeah, completely pulled all that out. Um, two lots of 90 mil thermalite. Yeah. Um, what do you call it? Laminated together. And then that was then glassed into the, into the transom. So and then, you were like looking at like 40 mil thick transom? Yeah, plus plus some because a heap of glass went over the top yeah, of that as yeah. well. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah, that is beefed up. So you, yeah. you'd be confident in just about strapping anything to that. Yeah, that's right. And I've, I've tied it all in to the floor and to the stringers. So originally, you know, like the top deck of those boats were like a couple of seats, you know, like the Haynes little seats in the back yeah. corners. And none of that sort of tied into the floor or to the stringers. So everything's all tied in at that back end. Um, I'm no like engineer or anything. I don't know if I've created a, a weak point in front of that now or not, but um, it's all really beefed up and super strong. And yeah, that was the, that was the end goal. So Thermalite um, added onto the transom, like laminated together and then glassed over and it's all tied into your stringers. Hey, did you do Thermalite all through the floor as well? Yeah, yeah, Thermalite stringers, Thermalite um, all up in the cabin. So all the bunks and everything's all Thermalite. Because um, it's just get away from timber and rot. Yeah, yeah, yep. nothing can rot. There is still a little bit of timber in the top deck, like original timber, but it wasn't rotten and so I just yeah. sort of left it and saved a bit of work. But um, yeah, the actual structure and bones of the boats all, all that might. The pockets on the side, did you cut them out as well and redo all that as well? Yeah, yeah, got rid of all that. Those door cards that are in those yeah. boats, they just sort of unbolt. So big, long, um, long, wide stringers. Uh, long wide, sorry, side pockets and some little top side pockets so you can chuck a bit of gear beside the seats. Did you know anything about doing this before you started it? No. Okay. No. So 
It's an intimidating take on, like it's a full very, rebuild, yeah. like to gut it and then redo the whole thing. Yeah. Um, everyone talks about having two, at least two bilge pumps in there. Did you take the opportunity to put uh, more in? No, I've got one and I've got a, um, a second one there, basically ready to just chuck in if I need it. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I've got one big one that's on a manual auto switch and yeah, that's kind of it. Yeah, okay. And foam filling the floor or did you get carried away with everything? What did yeah, you get? yeah, foam filled it. Um, which has like, there's lots of people, lots of different opinions on that, but I, mm. I think I more prefer have it than not. And just stability, strength, a little yeah. bit more weight though. It's a lot quieter as well. Oh, right. Yeah, it makes it really rigid. Um, you don't get that echoing noise. Feels less like a surfboard and more like a friggin' truck. Yeah, yeah, just <laughs> smash through the waves. Um, yeah, I, I foam filled, um, cut it level with the stringers, and then I glassed over top of that where I, where I cut the foam because it does expose, you know, like the bubbles, like little air pockets of the foam. So there's a chance that moisture can get in there. So okay. I glassed all that as well. Okay. Um, yeah, I tried not to cut any corners. And a lot of guys take the opportunity to change their fuel carrying capacity. And yep. what did you do? Um, I got two tanks. So I was adding this, yeah, you know, the bigger motor. I put a 200 mercury on the back of it, um, without knowing any calculations, any calculations or anything like that. I really wanted to make sure I had extra weight up the front in the nose, and never had a tank up in the nose. So I put a tank up the front, which is like an auxiliary tank more than anything. I hardly use it. I'll use it every now and then so that I keep moving the fuel through it. But I just really use it to keep weight up the front and level the boat out. Um, it still gets up on a plane when you're like under under load and, oh, yeah, and you've got that, fuel up there? Yeah, yeah. that 200, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Some guys, I've been chatting with a few guys that know their Hanes and, and you can make them those heavy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, it's, a de it's a delicate little, there's way more to boats than people realise. Yeah, yeah. it's not just a matter of just, yeah, doing just it, chucking a motor on and Mm. Yeah. Like, um, okay, cool. So then you, you've glassed over your, your foam fill. What about your flooring and what, what went over top of the tanks and all that sort of stuff? Yeah, so the floor, so the tanks are sealed in. Um, two separate tanks. They're linked internally. Um, What's the logic of having separate tanks? Just so I can keep that weight up the front. So rather than drawing from one tank and losing a total weight, you know, over that whole length of the boat, I can keep that. 100 or balanced. Yeah, keeps it up the nose and I can draw from it if I need to. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was the logic. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, so floor went in over top of the tanks, everything's all sealed in and I've got really basic just fill through the floor. So I'm not, um, not worried about any issues with breathers and stuff like that when I'm filling. Some guys have some dramas with that. Um, okay. Yeah. All right, cool. What was the floor material? Floor's thermalite. Um, everything's yeah, everything's thermalite through yeah, basically from the stringers up. Um, heap of glass went onto the floor, up into the sides of the hull, and I made sure that I really leveled it all off. And I actually at the rear of the boat, I actually kicked it up a little bit in the back corners. You always get that water pooling in the back corners of your boat, so I purposefully lifted it up a little bit so that the water. Um, heads towards the bilge basically when the when the boat's on the trailer. Ah, okay. I thought about it way too much. <laughs> yeah, that's good though. Yeah. Like, you almost want it overthought of because the last thing you want to do is a rework. Or, yeah, yeah. You now nah, well that water pooling and gets mouldy and all the rest and yeah. I guess the next part of the build is electrics, hydraulics, yep. thinking about all your lines and how they all interact. I always look at it and like even now I work with electricity and hydraulics aren't overwhelming, but I look at it and I, everyone goes, oh, it's the boat, it's pretty simple, you know, there's an yeah. outboard on the back and you have your hydraulic and yeah. But there's a bit more to it, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. And Walk I'm, me through how you learned how to do it all. Oh, YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's yeah. a lot of YouTube. I, um, I don't know, I'm half handy with, with stuff like that, obviously, and I, yeah, I wanted to do everything myself. I wanted to know, like, if I'm out there and something goes wrong, I, I can deal with it. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I put the motor on myself. The motor wasn't brand new. If it was brand new, I obviously would have got the dealer to put it on. But it was a um, second-hand, a low-hour second-hand motor. So I put that on myself. Okay. Um, so that was a learning curve. And 
Likewise with the steering, um, Dometic steering, which has been really good, or Sea Star um, steering, which is owned by Dometic now. Sorry, so is that a local Aussie company or? I don't, I don't, no, I, don't know I think it's American. That. You know, like Dometic Eskies and Dometic. No. Like Waco. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. yep. Um, Sea Star has been around forever. I'm pretty sure Dometic now owns Sea Star or something along those lines, but yeah. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, just hydraulic steering, just follow the instructions. It's all, it's not too bad, to be honest. Some guys cut the, they don't like the extra length because it feels weird having extra length of, um, you know, your your lines. In the rear of the boat. In the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. where it sort of comes over and, and ducks in, yeah. um, a lot of guys try and cut it too short or yeah. Because they think it's a mess. Yeah. But you can get yourself into trouble with that. Do they have like all that? Is that all written in the instructions? And I think it says to not, yeah, you know, to not obviously kink the hose. So it needs to be run in a way that it won't kink. And obviously, when you turn full, you know, full left, full right, or starboard port, yeah, um, yeah you're not going to kink anything. Basically, that's yeah. that's the biggest thing. And obviously, with your um, with your cabling's the same. And yeah, you don't want to put stress on that connection into the rear yeah. of the motor there. But um, it's all pretty user friendly, all that stuff. Yeah, right. Okay. But I did deliberate on it a lot for the height in the transom and stuff. But you know, it's so much work into that boat. I didn't want to drill a hole in the wrong spot. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, do you join everything? To, excuse my ignorance here. Do you join everything together in terms of electrics and hydraulics running down the side, or do you did you try and keep everything separate so that it was easier to diagnose and fix if? one of the lines need replacing and stuff like that? No, it's pretty, um, like running up the sides of the boat is pretty minimal, I guess. So I've got a few lights down the back that are fed from the cabin. Yeah. Um, obviously the two hydraulic lines that run down. But yeah, it's it's pretty simple. And I've I obviously designed it like that. Um, what do you have down the back that you're running for? So you you got uh, out, out the back of your trans, you got your motor, you've got your hydraulics, what else have you yeah. got down there? So I've got dual batteries, um, obviously. So I've got a house battery and a starter battery. I've got the bilge down there and I've got a couple of lights up inside the rear storage area. Yeah, um, transducer. Yeah, transducers down actually inside the boat, not on the back of the boat. So it's an in-hull. Um, it's not a through-hull, it's just an in-hull in, in a wet box, yeah. which reads, I don't know how we did it, but perfect. Out to, I've been out to 70 odd meters. I haven't been overly deep yet, yeah. but doing 30 knots, perfect bottom. Oh, sick. Like we just jagged it, so it was so good. I did do, I say just jagged it, I did do some testing with um, with a, a bit of timber with holes in different spots and okay. filled the bilge up with water, dropped the transducer in a few different spots. Um, do you have to think about that stuff before you obviously do your full rebuild? To a degree. I was yeah. always going to. I always wanted an in-hull. I didn't want something hanging yeah. off the back of the boat or a through-hull. Um, yeah, I, I did think about it. And you got to think about where strakes are and stuff like that. And if there's going to be anything on the front of the boat that's going to affect the reading of the transducer at the back as your, as your boat travels. But, yeah, we just jag that. So Sick. Yeah. And, um, okay, cool. So walk us through the back again so you have yeah, your sorry. wiring linked together down the side is it all yeah it's all just tucked up underneath the gunnels um there's conduit up inside the gunnels so everything runs through that it's it's super simple um oh, 50 mil conduit or yeah it's about that honestly yeah it would be about 50 yeah, yeah right. there's sections of it so you can you got like access points oh nice yeah okay. so it doesn't run the full length of the and moisture doesn't gather in there or? no it doesn't seem to it's all tinned yeah. Um, salt water just kills everything. Oh, it's yeah. just like, yeah, yeah. shock it. Yeah. But I tried to, um, like in the cabin, I tried to make everything neat and accessible so that um, you can diagnose any issues, um, which I haven't had. I have had one um, one issue with the Dometic trim tab controllers, oh, um, one nice. controller, but I think it was just a faulty controller. Um, new one's sweet, they're unreal. Trim tabs are unreal, make a big difference. Yeah. yeah. So would you just you, you don't have to be as strict with balancing ballast in the weight. And nah, weight yeah, that's switch. right. And those um, like listing into the wind. Um, yeah, especially here if you if you're running along the coast with that, you know, you've got that southeasterly breeze and a swell, and the boat just leans into that breeze. It's um, yeah, those trim tabs are just a game changer. Set, set. Ah, cool. I was going to ask you about that. 
Yeah, right. So, man, that's a lot of stuff to get your head around. So much. Yeah. yeah. What about, like, leg length and, and the prop size and all that? Because that's its own thing. Bro. Yeah, yeah, and I'm still playing with all that yeah. sort of stuff. I got a 25-inch leg. Um, the transom was originally 20 on those old Hanes. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I lifted it up and... Yeah, props and stuff, I, I definitely will look at more, but I wanted to, I didn't want to just start messing around with it straight away. I wanted to do multiple trips. I've done about eight or nine trips now in it. Um, so I've now lifted the motor one hole. I'm going to run that for a period, see how that goes. Yeah, right. See what you know, the average is, if it's an improvement or not. And if I can go up another hole, I will. What, what, what mileage are you getting out of it? Um, on average, about 1.5, 1.6 kilometres a litre. Yeah. And I reckon I should, I can get better than that. Yeah. Um, Some guys say like that two to one is like yeah. pretty good for a Haynes. You've got a big donk on a, on yeah, a, on yeah. a relatively small boat. And I'm carrying a fair bit of weight yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. So it's not that bad. But yeah, I'm not too worried about how fast it goes. More so, I um, want that economy. How fast does it go then? <laughs> <Four or five laughs> <nine. laughs> I'm not worried yeah. about how fast it goes, but yeah, I get along at 90 yeah. kilometers an hour. Yeah. yeah. But um, that's yeah. full hammer though. Yeah, yeah that's, that's full, full, full donk in the river. Yeah. yeah. But um. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's more about economy. The price of fuel is just ridiculous. Oh, 100%. Yeah. 100%. Did you, when you were shopping around for outboards, did you think about the new diesels they got? Oh, I did see them. Um, yeah, I haven't yeah I've looked at them a little bit. Yeah. There's diesel, there's electric motors getting around. and All sorts of craziness, he says. Yeah, the Mercury's, um, yeah, they seem to be a good motor these days. I think they always have been a pretty good motor. But, um, yeah, these ones now are getting a really good name. So. Sick. Heaps of Mate, thanks for walking us through a bit of the rebuild. Like, right. like I said, if guys want to go and have a look, I'm going to link it up in today's show notes. But um, Kurt's got like a four video series on on the rebuild and the process of it. And like, you don't have to learn everything the hard way. Kurt's no. already done all that learning for you. <laughs> so go in there, right. and if you're looking to rebuild a, a fiberglass boat, it's probably a really good jumping off point. Yeah, and if you've got any questions, um, send me a message. I'm, I love talking about it, and I've got a lot of information that I've kept as well, so I can just flick off to people. Mm. I'm going to pick your brain one day when I have some time. I'm going to <laughs> I'm going to do a rebuild too, because I like your idea and your thoughts around. You know how where stuff might fail and how to fix stuff, and there's there's something about learning through doing, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, well, like, you don't learn a language until you go to the country where they actually speak it. I, I couldn't learn it in school. Yeah. And I think, like, thinking about a boat, like, you, you're you not going to understand as much until you own one or rebuild one yourself. So yeah, definitely, cool. definitely. So talk to me about XL Adventures. How long has it been going? Um, what, why did you start the channel? And I want to get into a philosophical discussion about, like, wearing a GoPro when you're spearing, because I still <laughs> struggle with it. Man. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. So XL Adventures, I don't know if we talked about this before we started recording, but um, yeah, like Mackay copping a lot of flack. And at the time, I I hadn't been spearing for all that long. I was kite surfing a lot, um, stand up paddle boarding, surfing, you know, doing everything like like what I said, like not enough time to do everything to do a Mackay and see people just smack a Mackay saying there's nothing to do here, there's nothing to do yeah. here. And I'm like, there's so much to yeah. do. Like, <laughs> there's so much to do What's everywhere right? if you look for it, yeah. yeah. And um, so that was a big push. Um, I had a dear friend who passed away at work. Um, I was heavily involved with with that. And he was always pushing us. He's like, you guys do some cool stuff. You need to like put it out there. Yeah. And um, it was sort of post that I really bumped it up a little bit. I thought, you know what, he's right. And Yeah, that's cool. So I started um, posting more regularly, um, but really like burning through footage. Um, <laughs> like I had a year and a half worth of footage here and I burnt through it so quickly doing like short snappy videos with a lot of fish. And um, I'll actually be able to revisit some of that and like learn a bit from that as well in future videos. But yeah, yeah, the big thing was to sort of promote Mackay a little bit, um, show you what we do have out there and learn as well for myself. Um, yeah, I'm just interested in it, interested in the video building process and all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah. Always sort of like that sort of stuff. How long have you been doing it? I've been spearing, my young fella turned seven um, two days ago and I've been spearing pretty well. I've got a photo of my wife sitting on the couch about to explode with all my new spearfishing gear sitting on the ground in front of her. And she's sort of, it's a funny picture because she's like, 
got this funny look on her face looking at all this gear and I think she's realised what's about to happen. Man, you've come a long way in seven years, eh? Yeah, it's been, a, it's been an adventure. That's cool about documenting it too because it's almost like when you edit stuff and you put it all together, you, it's almost like you're actively debriefing yourself. So you're, you're going over and cementing in some of those lessons that you've learned. Yeah, 100%. And that's, yeah, that's the beauty of it as well. And like other people as well, you get comments on like, you know, you could have done this or why did you do this? And it sort of prompts thoughts and yeah, it's good for that. Um, recently you were chatting about maybe getting away from GoPro and moving to another action cam. Mm -hmm. um, what GoPros are you shooting with now and what sort of, what's making you a bit gun shy with them? Um, I'm shooting with a seven and an eight. Um, the seven's good, the eight's shocking. Um, and I've heard mixed reviews about these later ones as well with like overheating issues and stuff they're like that. They've just overheated before yeah, in the housing. Yeah, <laughs> but if you're underwater, they don't. No, they're not as bad. But you want that, you want the dry land stuff too. I had it in the super suit, obviously, because it sits nicely in that thing. But um, yeah, yeah, yeah I, just, I broke that friggin' thing too <laughs> the first time out. I bought the wrong housing. I bought a GoPro Hero 9 housing and the 10 is just slightly different but won't fit. Yeah, yeah. right. And I took it to WA with the 9 housing wouldn't fit. So I knew, they waterproof to 10. So I was like, I'll oh, use this as the boat can and then like a little bit of just surface stuff maybe. And um, we're yeah. going out there, Bert's full send in his boat. Yeah. And um, the thing smashed into one of the support pillars and <sighs> broke the rear screen. And it's like, this scope, like it's just, that's, I mean, that's spirit. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. Um, what are you considering as well yeah. instead? DJI, um, I've recently watched Aaron Young's video. Yeah, um, that he, he might be with I love, I love Aaron He's Young. He's a mad yeah. dude. He's I'd love to get over there and go for a dive with him. Yeah. He'd just be a cool dude to hang out so with. So um, Yeah, 100%. And like that type of diving he does, I love yeah. that. That's me to a T. But um, he does, yeah. Like he's like you. Like he mixes the inshore and the offshore. And yeah, on all of it's it. very similar to what we got here. Just he's got that better viz. But um, yeah, cruising through the canals and all that sort of stuff. I love all that stuff. Yeah. But um, yeah, DJI recently did a comparison. I've also just watched a comparison with, well, not a comparison, but some videos done with the new Insta three hundred and sixty. Yeah. Which looks unreal, especially in low light. Okay. Um, which GoPro is really not so good at the low light stuff. Um, well, you can do your EV comp, hey, that's how you get around it, isn't it? You can go like minus and sort of bring up your low light stuff. Is that how you do it? I'm not too sure with the GoPros. Yeah. Um, yeah, in the settings is the EV comp. I'm pretty sure that's how you, how you can um, yeah, up right. that low light stuff. But yeah, I hear what you're saying. The sense is not super good, I think. No. Um, yeah, that's, that's sort of where I'm at with that. But I mean, like the seven and eight are old. Like, yeah, um, we're up to 12 or something. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. But they do a good job still um, yeah. when they work. Yeah, it's just more recently they're starting to fail a little bit. And, um, yeah, Ben's having some dramas with his as well. What's he running? I think he's got a nine possibly. Yeah. Um, yeah, like the batteries expanding and stuff like that. He's been burning through a fair few batteries. <laughs> yeah. I was out the other day. I've got a seven and a ten. And I don't like using either of them. <laughs> <laughs> Felt like I'm out with my two mates and they're line fishermen. And, uh, you know, it is what it is. But I jumped in and then it was wicked fishy. And I was like, oh, can you throw me my GoPro? And um, no, no, no. I jumped in with it back to front for whatever reason on my head strap. <laughs> yeah. And then I threw it in. I said, oh, hey, can you fix this and turn the camera around? And then my mate um, undid the housing and then threw it back to me accidentally. He didn't. Oh. Yeah, so it's flooded my seven, it's wrecked, it's oh, gone. Man. But I can't really blame him because I should have had the frigging thing done. Yeah, right. yeah. But yeah, like, and now I've just got the 10, but I'm, I'm about, I'm going to go buy another one too. Because, yeah. like, there is something about capturing some of your stuff. Like, it's it's pretty cool, man. Yeah. I find it disruptive, though, sometimes. How do you, what's your work around? I mean, I mean it's, Blokes aren't generally good at doing two things at once. I want yeah. to go spearfishing or I want to go filming. It's hard to do the two together. Can you talk to that for a sec? It's, um, it's like the steps. So if I'm, if I'm diving and I don't have my GoPro, which is very, very rare, I, I, have, um, I do do it from time to time if I'm out with the kids and stuff like that, I'll, I'll go to turn it on. 
because that's part of, that's part oh, of that's my part of that's part of my pre dive process. Yeah. Sick. So it's it's always you know breathing up for a period of time. Um, yeah, it'll be GoPro on, final couple of breaths, take that big breath, snorkel out, duck dive and go, and GoPro's on. Nice. Um, yeah, I'll go up there, I'll be clicking, I'll be, I'll be like, what am I missing here? <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah. the GoPro's not there. Yeah. So that's, that's, I just do it every time. GoPro angle, um, like the angle of the camera, so many yeah. guys, the, the fish is just out of shot. Yeah. You seldomly do it though, from what I've seen. Yeah, I'm generally pretty good. It'll be, um, if I forget, which isn't all that often, but um, yeah, just run your hand in line with your mask, basically use your, use your mask as a guide to level your GoPro off. Um, just jump in the water and just yeah, level it off with the front of your mask. And you're a head strap guy over a mask guy? Yeah. Talk to that if you can. Um, like what I was saying before, like I was on the bottom, you know, 10, 12 meters and I took it off. You know, I can take it off and I can point and I was shooting some, um, some clownfish in the coral and stuff like that. Like you can, you can just rip it off when you want. Oh, so you wear it over top of your mask? Yep. I um, did a Daniel Mann tuck the snorkel in to yeah. hold the strap. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Yeah, it was a good little tip. I, I hadn't, hadn't, haven't actually worked that out yet. I would normally wear it under my hood yep. and then mask over top of that, but it, it, it kind of annoys you underneath your hood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of them, yeah. It breaks the seal on your hood. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, I might try that one. Yeah. Mm. Daniel, I remember him talking about it, but I just haven't done it. Yeah, it works really, really well. And if, if you forget about it, you gotta rip your mask off and it, it stays there with your mask. It's like tangles it in, it's really clever. And you talked a little bit earlier about like when you're reflecting, looking at footage, it's good to see you slow down when you're looking around and all that sort of stuff. Mm. Um, yeah, definitely less so more recently, um, but working on improving that. Um, you can see my previous videos like two and a half minute dives stalking a 65 centimeter trout but um really really slow really controlled movements crawling on the bottom um that's where i want to get back to being comfortable but doing those longer dives with a dive buddy obviously um that particular dive no dive buddy made up in the boat and got the trout but um <laughs> <laughs> it's too long to be hanging around down there some of those trout they the bigger ones they sit there, they look at you, and then you, you, you bring your gun up and then they scoot off five yeah, metres. Yeah. And then they turn and look at you again. Yeah. And then you can do that for 100 metres. Yeah. And, that, and like, you don't get the fish. Yeah. <laughs> Not yeah. always. Not always. Yeah. But sometimes you do. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that's part of the fun though, isn't it? That is. That yeah. is. Yeah. Mm. Tuskies can be good for that as well. Mm. So you're a Waikai frother hardcore, but you definitely like getting out and ranging wider. Um, what are your aspirations with regards to travel and um, maybe where the channel's going in the future? Um, definitely want to get like north, head north a little bit more. Um, having, having said that, want to go south, probably won't take the boat, but um, I love to do some, you know, like kingfish diving and stuff like that yeah, down yeah. south. Um, head down with Ben hopefully next year for the bluefin run. He's been doing that um, last couple of years in a row, so it'd be good to go down and do that. As South Australia or, or Vic? He, yeah, out of Vic. Yeah. yeah. Um, just recently he did that. Yeah. And, yeah. Well, Tassie, Tassie's got their own one too. Oh, yeah, 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 that'd be sick. Yeah. I'd love to get down for the Kingfish Cup. Um, yeah. That'd be awesome. In Sydney? Yeah, yeah. Central Coast there, awesome. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chase some Jewfish down there. Mm. I'd love to do that in the wash. Yeah, yeah, oh. yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> But, yeah, um, it's cool. Like, it, it, like the East Coast got quite a lot of different ground and, te and temperature ranges, so yeah. the, the species change up and down the coast. It's yeah, cool. yeah, I would miss coral trout, man. Like, yeah. Rizzy, we get them really, you know. Sunny Coast, they get them if, that, if decent divers normally. Um, but up here, like, it's your bread and butter, you know. Yeah, yeah. I love it, though. I love yeah. shooting trout. I mean, you can shoot trout on a rock wall here at the harbour. Oh, like, yeah, that's so yeah. good. So good. But yeah, in terms of the channel, um, I really love, I know you've had Rod on recently or last year, Rocket. Mm. Um, I love his little adventures that he does. Yeah. Um, again, Rocket yeah, YouTube. Rocket Kit on YouTube is a weapon. And um, Wet Mammal, Sam stuff, his hike to spear stuff. Yeah, I love yeah, to do that sort of stuff. We've got a lot of ground here that you could do similar things to that. Mm. I sort of like the idea of the idea of that, sort of taking what you got. and. 
What do you think about blowing up spots? Because like out here off Mackay, you guys have got a number of like really sick islands. Mm. But you almost wouldn't want to tell everyone everything, would you? No, and you notice I get a lot of people, well, not a lot of people, but people message me saying like, you were here. I was like, no, I wasn't. Like, you might think I was there, but that's not where I was. And I do my best to not burn spots, um, especially starting out um what seven odd years ago now i was going out with a lot of people so a lot of places that i go i have been with other people and i, I definitely don't want to burn those spots like um it's hard when you got a youtube channel man like, it is hard it's, it's work to avoid inadvertently like yeah that's right and you got to be conscious of it with your shots and stuff like that like often when i'm out with ben we both got gopros on there'll be a good shot and a bad shot like yeah. a, a really <laughs> obvious oh that's where they are and yeah yeah it's um like some of the cluey guys can pick it, but the general general public um, would do my best, like cut the videos as soon as you hit the surface and then back on as you come under and, yeah. yeah the other thing too is it's like time, place is okay sometimes, but if they get time and place, mm. like particularly for some species, that's that's like you're giving away the secret sauce. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And um, I've tried to steer clear of it on the potty because I didn't want to be respectful to local people and protecting their spots because, like, as much as I love helping people start spearfishing, I think you need to learn how to find good spots and ground by yourself. Yeah, that's and then right. you'll jealously guard it, and that's good. Yeah. Person to person sharing, I think, is okay, but not social media, not where we we're putting potentially thousands of people onto a spot. Yeah, that's right. No, no place can handle that amount of pressure. No, no. And that that was a big thing for me with my boat is um, with the Haynes and building the Haynes was going and finding those magic spots. And that's like a big focus with, with Ben and myself. Um, like we did last week, we went out chasing some marks that he'd run across in the fisheries boat and he'd taken note. <laughs> those guys do a lot of miles out there. Yeah, yeah. So we checked some spots and um, yeah, big bull shark, but yeah, it's definitely a promising <laughs> spot. <laughs> yeah. I like it. I, I, I like the sound of that. Big sharks, yeah, over good like looking structure. That sounds fun. Yeah, I can't wait till the visit's here. I'm gonna head straight back. It's gonna be good. If your buddy had a blackout on your next beer fishing trip, think. What would the outcome of that be? Do you know how to revive someone from a blackout? Would you even be in a position to do something about it? Or would you be diving, chasing after a fish as your buddy sinks down to the bottom of the ocean? Do you know where most blackouts happen? Do you know what you can do to minimize your risk of having a blackout? My name is Ted Hardy, and I'm the founder of freedivingsafety.com. In my free online course, you will learn the truth about shallow water blackout, the myth of, I don't push myself, I know my limits, I'm in tune with my body, how to minimize your risk of having a blackout, and most importantly, how to save your buddy's life if they have one. Visit freedivingsafety.com to sign up for your free course today dive safe out there it's it's not even that hard sometimes with weather and commitments it's a long time between drinks in your spearfishing journey if you want a dry training program that can keep you in some kind of shape for spearfishing check out ted hardy's 28 day freediving transformation at noobspero.com forward slash ted that's noobspero.com forward slash ted now the 28 day freediving transformation is just a practical dry training plan that ted hardy will walk you through and it will help you get results even if you can't get wet at the moment. Check it out at noobspero.com forward slash Ted. Scary stuff. Have you had a, a moment that, that scared you in your seven years? Um, the biggest thing obviously was that blackout. Um, yeah, yeah. I haven't, yeah, that was, that was a real wake up call for me. Um, in terms of like marine life and stuff, I've, I've been pretty lucky. I've had... Yeah, like you've had the sharknadoes and stuff like that and then reef sharks trying to catch or trying to take fish off you. and um, Crocs? No, no crocs. So here, there'd definitely be a decent croc in that river, I would, I would imagine, somewhere. Um, rarely sighted. We more so seem to get them sort of moving in and out of the systems that we have here, like the yeah. bigger systems. Um, I think the... Yeah, you know, like the big animals push on or move on the small animals. Um, they recently took one of the one of the crocs um, out of the system um, last year or the year before. One that just hung, sort of hung around a little bit too much out near the harbour. There, yeah. they went out and they um, they shot that one. 
But yeah, I think further north, definitely. Like Proserpine, which is an hour and a half or roughly from here, Crossy River is full of crocs. Mm. But yeah, locally here, um, the bigger systems have their big resident croc and yeah, on the headlands and stuff like that. They definitely come past from time to time, but yeah, not not like what you see further north. Yeah, right. Yeah, they, uh, like, uh, they're the unknown for me. That, that So they scare the shit out of me. Yeah, yeah. Sharks are kind of a, a known thing for me. I'm not, I'm not saying, like, they don't deserve 100% respect, but crocs to me are just like, the, I don't know, they just, I don't... Yeah, I fully understand. Seems a bit more unpredictable. Well, I think I'm diving in a river and there's a big croc. I don't have a boat. I've got to swim to where to get out. Yeah. And that <laughs> that's scary. Yeah, you pick yeah. your spots and yeah. like you go with locals. Yeah, and you you like what we were talking about earlier. Like you um you pre-plan. Like I'm big on um pre-planning and making sure that there's not a solution to every problem, but like a, there's an out. So it's like planning a short dive, like I'm gonna top in here, the current's going this way, we'll get out here. Um, yeah, having a bit of a plan and having a plan when something does go wrong or if something goes wrong. Um, like you shoot a big Spanish and he takes all your gear, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna let it go? Are you gonna chase it? Like are you gonna chase it down current? Do you need to swim up current to get back? Like you need to know what you're gonna do in those different circumstances. So it's like scenario planning, so you have some yeah. ideas. So you're not having to make decisions like rushed, panicked decisions. You kind of already sort of prepared for it. Yeah, that's right, 100%. Yeah. And I've, I've, had, I've had it before and I've, um, yeah, I'm really big on that visualizing. I think that plays a big part. And that's something that I learned from kite surfing, like trying to learn new tricks. You visualize it in your head and it helps so much to do that, to then put that onto the water and go out and do it. And it's the same as spearing. Brains like yours, though, have trouble turning off to go to sleep. Oh, they do. <laughs> <laughs> Shock. Yeah, yeah. But uh, it's, it's good. Like, you do get a level of self-awareness about it as you get older, too. Yeah. Uh, all good, man. Um, funny stuff? Um, you listen to the potty. You know what I Yeah, like. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, funny things. Poo stuff? You like poo stuff, yeah, don't you? Yeah, you know. <laughs> That's, I've, that's I've, definitely, I've definitely set myself up a couple of times trying to do the right thing and not be near anybody when you're doing it, but you end up in like a backwash, just being surrounded in your own your own bodily <laughs> solids. <laughs> bodily solids. <laughs> <laughs> that's happened a couple of times. It's shocking. Yeah. Have Terrible. you climbed back on the boat with your own poo on you? No, I don't know. Maybe he's done that in his hood, get back to the ramp, and what's that smell? And oh, he's picked it back up again. Rank. Yeah. Terrible. Yeah, Smythe in office had a cracker story about one of the boys get, trying to get back on the boat covered in poo. Uh -huh. I was just like, Ugh. I did my best. You got to keep on that back. Though. Yeah, <laughs> it's like it's like float line management, but it's yeah. poo line management. Hundred yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> percent. All right, man. Um, last sort of part of the show is spirit Q and A. Some sort of faster paced round of questions. Um, uh, best piece of advice you've ever been given? I got the perfect one for this. When you think you need to speed up, slow down. Yeah. If you haven't watched it, Kimmy Werner yeah. um, TED Talk. Um, I've used that so many times in in every aspect of life. Yeah, um, yeah. It plays. Yeah. yeah, it fits everything. When you when you start sitting down and thinking about it, it really does. Yeah, it works in life too, like you say, because so much of us, it's knee jerk reaction. Yeah, 100%. and uh, you should you want to respond, not react. Yeah, and. In the water, it's kind of like multiplied, I reckon. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I love that TED Talk too. I'll link yeah. that up in the show notes as well. So good. Um, all good. Um, best resource for spearfishing? Is this a trick? Nah, it's <laughs> not, man. It's not. <laughs> I'd, 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 honestly, I'd, if you're a beginner spear fisherman, go to episode one of Noob Spearo <laughs> and work your way through. Oh, because, don't go to Oh, episode maybe. One. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Shrek and Turbo carrying on. Yeah, but, um, yeah. Nah, nah. nah that's it. It's. It's amazing. Like it's it'll help your progression so much. Um, on top of that, Ted Hardy stuff. I was going to mention it before. Actually, Ted Ted's got um, yeah freedivingsafety.com, and he's got a lot of free gear on there. Mm -hmm. um, he's also been throwing heaps of shorts up. If you don't follow him, follow his little shorts. He's been putting up. I think daily, just about. Yeah. Um, they've been awesome. That's immersion freediver. He's he's got like freediver university, I think now as yeah, well. Like, yeah. But yeah, he's always his passion is like educating spiros and freedivers about you know just better, smarter practice. Yeah, there yeah, seems to be right. shit there for sure. 
Awesome. And XL Adventures, obviously, on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. XL Adventures. Yeah, That's yeah. It. Sometimes, like last night, we had these young guys out and they're the YouTube gen for sure, the social media gen. And your channel's perfect for like, you watch a 20 minute bit and most of it's a spearing adventure focus, but there's generally like one or two like big takeaways. And I reckon it's good for the younger gen, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad to hear you like taking your responsibility and, and having a little, little awareness about. You know, like you're thinking, oh, there's 14 year olds watching my channel. What message do I want them to get? And that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And obviously, the dive club as well. That's a mm. that's a big thing. Like yeah. college and oh. local heads. Like so, it's the Mackay Down Under Spearfishing Club. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. And um, I've got a list of clubs in your local area for listeners that are everywhere. Uh, go to newsgrow.com. Uh, the Mackay Club is definitely linked up in there. Yeah, it's on that. Yeah. And. Um, yeah, getting plugging into your local community is massive. Yeah, you know? yeah. yeah. Especially yeah, the clubs that give back. That's 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 what it's all about. Try and give back to the members, and that's what we're doing with the um, pool training stuff. So yeah, yeah, that'd be good. yeah. yeah. Well, well, you've got that up and running. So what, what, what's the what's the schedule there? Have you guys locked anything in? Um, it's a fast and loose at the moment. <laughs> yeah, really, really loose. It's a Monday and a Thursday thing. Um, this Thursday just gone was the most recent one. Um, I wasn't able to make it because I was still out at work. So yeah, Monday will be the first one for me and we'll just be finding our way, finding our feet, I guess, for the first few months and then, yeah, try and make some sort of regular thing happen. Awesome. Yeah. So, but if guys want to um, go to Mackay Down Under Spearfishing Club, um, the details for the pool training, I'm sure, will be up there on their socials or on their, on their website. Um, but awesome, Kurt, mate, what an absolute, uh, it's, it's been great catching up with you, man. Yeah, like you, you too. we've had all sorts of things happen over the years, and you've um, been a big supporter, and and I've been a big supporter of yours too. It's, been, it's great to meet you in person, and and finally get to do an interview with you. Yeah, we'll have to link up for a dive in this weather. Get to that. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. It was a little bit. This is a little bit of a mad rash. Yeah, so, yeah. Like, but we'll, we'll get a bit more strategic in the future, man. Where can people come and find you, you on socials? Yeah, I'm on uh, XL Adventures on Instagram. We can search my name as well. I think Kurt Raymond, um, Facebook, YouTube, and that's it. I haven't got into the TikTok and Snapchat world yet. Yeah. Um, maybe in the future, but it's a post and ghost affair if you're on too many. Oh man, yeah. it's hard enough as it is. So, yeah. yeah, we were talking about messages getting buried over yeah, the different platforms right. and stuff. Um, oh, good, Kurt. Hey, magic. Um, last question. Um, if you had to describe the spearfishing experience in one sentence, how would you do it? A way to get out into the world and centre yourself in a time of chaos. <laughs> we know. Well, maybe not chaos, but yeah. Yeah, yeah when, when life gets so hectic, it's, yeah, it really just calms you down get out into the into nature and enjoy it. Sick, man, awesome. Guys, go like, subscribe, do all those good things with XL Adventures. Kurt is making wicked videos about Mackay. Um, legend, great to catch you, great to catch you, bro. Thanks, man. Hey, legends, hope you enjoyed learning a little bit more about Kurt Raymond, the man behind the XL Adventures YouTube channel. Uh, he's got a, it's really low key YouTube channel if you want to watch it, like, um, He's really inspired, as you mentioned, by Key West Waterman. And I think Kurt sort of captured a lot of that same style, very down to earth, super informative, great information. And, and that sort of that cool no ego vibe, which I really, really resonate with. So XL Adventures, check him out on YouTube. Go subscribe to that, man. Um, as usual, guys, massive thanks to those of you that have left reviews, where, wherever it is, for the podcast, if you've come and done a course, if you're heading out on a, a trip like the Whitsundays, Sal and Spear Trip up on spearfishingcourses.com.au. If, you if you've left a review, if you're part of this community, massive thanks to you. I've, honestly, like you guys are what keeps this podcast going, whether it's telling your mate about a cool episode or whatever it is, I really appreciate it. And as usual, if you want to take that next step and support the show on an episode-by-episode -episode basis, you can do so for as little as $1 an episode. Go to patreon.com forward slash noobspiro and join 43 other frothers keeping fuel in the outboard. Hey, guys, that's it for me for this week. I'm hoping to come back next week or in two weeks' time and do the top Spiro YouTube channels of 2024. Sound good? I'm a bit of subscribe. Hit that like button. <laughs> that's it for me, guys. See you. I'll catch you next week. In a world of cancel culture, we need to be bold and stand up. Ignore the self-censorship, have a laugh and poke the bear. 
or in this case a shark, but fuck the tax man. Listeners get a free hat of their choice when they spend over $100 at noobsparrow.com forward slash taxman when they use the code at noobsparrow with designs that capture the frustration of having your fish taxed. You'll love the FTTM long sleeve UV blocking fishing jerseys, t-shirts, hats and more. Visit noobsparrow.com forward slash taxman. Use the code noobsparrow to score a free hat of your choice when you spend $100 or more. Again, go to noobsparrow.com forward slash taxman. Buying gear online can be tricky. You ask yourself the same questions. Will it arrive on time? Is it actually what I want? How much is the shipping going to cost? Great news. The name you can trust is Neptonics. Neptonics. Solid gear that works. Visit Neptonics. Buy tough gear. Use the code NOOB10 to save 10%. That's right. Use the code NOOB10, N-O-O-B-10, to save 10% on your order at Neptonics.com. Are you looking for spearfishing gear in Australia? Head on down to your local Adreno Spearfishing Superstore today and explore their ginormous stores filled with mad gear and frothing staff. On top of a huge selection of high quality Australia price matched guaranteed spearing kit and high quality experts bureau staff, Adreno offer afterpay and a super easy returns policy. Adreno will have you geared up for your next spearing sesh with a massive smile. That's Adreno Spearfishing with stores located in Perth, Aspley, Woolongabba, Brisbane, the Gold Coast, Sydney, Melbourne. Get into it. Head in today or shop online at adreno.com.au. Use the code NOOPSPIRO to save $20 on every purchase over $200. Online or even better, in-store. Your new spear gear is waiting for you. (laughs) 